All right, welcome to Efficient ML.AI Lecture 9 and Lecture 8. We are going to talk about the second part of Neural Architecture Search. So in the last lecture, we talked about the part one of Neural Architecture Search, which is basically saying there's no free lunch. We want to get a good architecture that can get a good trade-off between the latency, accuracy, energy, and the storage. In order to achieve that, we talk about those basic operations um, of building neural nets, classic building blocks, bottleneck layer, inverted bottleneck layer, um, and also the transformer layers, an introduction to the NAS, including the search space, and how to design the search space, and what are the search strategies. And in this lecture, we will start talking about how do we estimate the reward, uh, which is the accuracy, accuracy estimation. As you can imagine, a good architecture, you want to make sure you can get its accuracy, but accuracy requires the training, which is pretty slow and costly. And how do we make it cheaper? So efficiently search the architecture. And also zero shot NAS, can we uh, estimate the performance, the accuracy without training it? Zero shot, just looking at it. Hardware aware NAS, how to search an efficient architecture? Make sure that the model we find runs fast on the target hardware platform. So this is efficiently search and efficient architecture. Okay, efficiently search and efficient architecture. And we can further open the design space, not only designing the neural architecture, but also the hardware architecture that accelerates the uh, customized um, neural architecture. So we'll talk about neural hardware architecture co-search. And finally, we are going to wrap up by talking about a bunch of applications that can be accelerated by these NAS algorithms, including the NLP applications, scan models, generative models, this point cloud, while they use using ADAS, autonomous driving, pose estimation for um, human computer interactions. Okay, so uh, this is the rest of the lecture for today. And we'll start with the accuracy estimation strategy. We've covered the search space, which is the design space in which we are going to search the neural architecture, including the cell level um, search space and also the network level search space. And this search strategy defines how to explore the search space and how do we sample from the next neural architecture. We can do a simple grid search or a random search, which is basically the starting point we are going to use to do a sanity check. We are actually going to do that, uh, try that in the homework, using reinforcement learning, using gradient descent, make latency differentiable, like we talked about in the lecture, how to make latency differentiable. And finally, the evolutionary search, which we are going to implement in lab three. <laughs> so in this lecture, we'll focus on uh, given an architecture, how do we quickly estimate the performance, which is the accuracy? I uh, will cover train from scratch, which is the most naive approach. Inherit the weight and using a hyper network to save the cost of estimating the accuracy, the performance. And we feed back that performance to the search strategy to update the next sample, the next architecture that we are going to explore. So the basic approach, uh, the most simplest approach is basically train the model from scratch and observe the accuracy. Then you pr propose a architecture by the controller and then we train it update, uh, and obtain the accuracy and update the controller. And the drawback here is it has prohibitive training costs. For example, on Cypher 10, people have to train 12,000 models, 12,000 models in order to search for the best one. That is taking 22,000 GPU hours. What if we, we want to scale it to larger scale data set, like ImageNet, COCO for detection, for classification, etc. So people propose all kinds of lighter weight methods to efficiently search the architecture. So we can inherit the weight. So you have already trained a bunch of stuff. 
you don't want to throw it away. Previously, every time you're restarting, you're restarting, you're trading from scratch. Now we want to inherit from, say, this is the already trained model. We can inherit it to make it wider. Right here, you have uh, two neurons in this layer. Now you want to have three. And the way we, we do that is by a mathematical equal transformation. You can split the parameter f to be half of f and half of f. So you can copy the duplicate node and have two copies of that and have the structs in the, for each parameter. So this is net to wider net from this paper. We can also expand the depth um, by inserting an identity layer. So and the layer followed by an identity layer, you put them together, you still the original layer, right? So you can continue training from this model. So every time you are standing on the shoulder of the giants, you're no longer restarting every time by using this neither net to wider net or net to deeper net. So using this approach um, for the controller, rather than each time we propose a new architecture, the NCHW different parameters, now the action would be make it wider or make it deeper using um, the approach in net to net. So we can propose uh, to either net to wider net or net to deeper net. And then we are continue to train the same set of parameters without having to train it from scratch. So the generator will generate natural transformation actions to update the model architecture rather than proposing a completely new model architecture. The next approach would be to train this hyper network. So what is a hyper network? So that network predicts the weight of a target network. You have a predictor. The predictor, the result is the weight of your desired network. Okay, and how? What is it? What is the predictor based on? It is based on the model's architecture embedding, like the NCHW, the different sizes, etc. So that is not enough. Size is not the only thing, but topology matters. So we want to transform this initial node embedding through a graph neural network. Since uh, see, uh, the neural network is a computing graph. So graph is a pretty good representation of the neural network architecture. You have the information of your neighbor, your neighbor's neighbor, you have different degrees. And graph neural nets is a very good feature extractor to extract the feature of the neural network architecture. So we pass it through several layers of graph neural net, which transforms the first, the initial uh, architecture embedding into the final architecture embedding. And we use uh, this NLP, this, uh, which is the hyper network, taking the node embedding as the feature to predict the weight of the original neural network. So this network is used to predict the weight of our target network. For example, this is yellow, then associate that with yellow, uh, this is dark blue, then we associate this node with dark blue, and this is green, then we associate this node with, with green. So when we are changing the architecture, what do we change and what remains the same? When we are sampling a new neural network architecture, This hyper network remains the same, right? We can update this hyper network, but here, when you are proposing a new neural network architecture, the embedding gets changed. The final embedding also gets changed. But we are we can just train uh, this hyper network to predict a new set of weights. So we are sharing the information here rather than train something, throw it away, train something, throw it away. Right here, we are not throwing away this MLP, this hyper network. 
So we can use the gradient descent to update the weights of the hyper network. What if we go to the other the, the very extreme? We don't train it at all by using zero shot mass, which is saying, can we accuracy or uh, estimate the accuracy without even training it? So previously, we try to see if this architecture is good or not. We have to train it on the GPU, train it for quite a while, and then estimate the accuracy. You know what? Not to wider net, not to deep, deeper net, sharing the weights, hyperparameter, hyper hyper network, whatever whatever you have. You have to train it at least for a while. But zero shot NAS is basically saying we just eyeball check, just look at the network, look at different components without training it at all. Just analyze the architecture without training and estimate the accuracy. And we're going to see two methods, ZNAS and also Greg sign. So what is ZNAS doing? So it's trying to say, we want to give a little bit of perturbation to the input and a small perturbation to X to get a new X, okay? And we initialize all the weights to a, with a random uh, with random number form, um, following the normal distribution. And we try to see the difference between the fx and f slash x. If you change the input a little bit, uh, the hypothesis here is that a good model is supposed to, should be able to uh, amplify this change, should be sensitive about such input perturbation. So you change a little bit, the input a little bit, the output supposed to change very drastically. This makes some sense, right? You want to distinguish A and B. If you change the input from A to B, the output doesn't change at all. This may not be a good model. Question here. I have one, one question about this is that what about small perturbation like adversarial ones, where a little bit change uh, should not change the model output. But in this case, the model uh, Right. Therefore, we try to, there's a second term, right? The first term may not be enough. Um, the model might have very drastic change no matter what the input is. That is not stable, not robust. So this method is adding a second term, which the batch normalization variance. So what does batch normalization do? Is try to flatten, to stabilize the distribution of the output feature map across different inputs. Right. So it try to compensate for the first term by adding the batch normalization variance, which is calculated in this way. And finally, we have the sense for mm -hmm. to be the perturbation plus um, the, 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 uh, the variance of the batch normalization layer. But this covers some of the intuition, but it still has a high risk. There still might be some other Becerra methods that might be able to attack this approach. So as you can imagine, that totally makes sense. We don't train it at all, but you want to get accuracy. That's not quite reasonable to begin with if everything is 100% accurate. Then we don't have to train neural network at all. Right? So this is just some of the heuristics that might be able to offer you some kind of in insight. At least help you eliminate some of the incorrect models. For example, if a model, the input changed from A to B, but the output doesn't change at all. But the output doesn't change at all. Then we are almost certain this may not be a good architecture. The input changed, but the output remains the same, right? So, um, so good model should be sensitive to input perturbations, but it's not saying. If the model is sensitive to input perturbations, that is certainly to be uh, that is certainly a good model. All right. So another intuition is that if a model is pretty good, um, the distance between the local minima, two different local minima, should be um, closer. Um, there is a higher probability that the gradients of different samples have the same sign. Like here, these two local minima are pretty far away. 
right? For this one, the local minima are closer. If that is the case, um, the sign of um, the gradient of different samples uh, should have the same sign. Like right here um, versus here, you can find that the, the direction of the gradient is different. So we are just some kind of have a for loop over other samples, okay, different inputs, and then sample uh, and loop over different layers. And for different layer, we add up all the gradients corresponding to uh, the sample I in layer K. And if they have the same sign, this, this number is supposed to be larger. If everything has the same sign, either positive, positive or negative, the largest value uh, could be n. But if I have one minus one, one minus one, all the signs are different, this number will be zero. So it's the, uh, for all the layers, for all the samples, if you sum up across different samples, uh, the sign of the gradient should be consistent. Okay, so those are some of the uh, performance estimation uh, methods. So that it only gave you part of the story, right? Which is the accuracy. But accuracy is not all we want. We want the model to be slow, to run fast. So we need to make it hardware aware to have not only accuracy information, but also the latency, the energy, the other hardware related information. For example, um, one approach we can assume ideally a good model that can fit different hardware platforms. If it's a ge general purpose model, it might be inefficient because different hardware platforms prefer different kind of computing. Like GPU has pretty large parallelism. If you increase the channel by doubling it, two size, twice as the channel number, it may not change the latency at all. If you are not saturating the number of uh, kinds of cores. But, the, uh, but a, a Raspberry Pi may have much smaller amount of memory. So if your uh, model size can barely fit the SRAM versus just increase by even like one kilobyte, it's not going to fit the cache. The performance may be drastically different. High-end CPU, low-end CPU, they all have different size of the cache, right? So here, specialization is a very good approach to improve the efficiency. You want to have a specialized model for the Pi, specialized model for the GPU, specialized for the model for the CPU, for mobile, etc. But what is what is the um, overhead here? The design cost, right? Previously, you just designed one model, rather than 50, that's it, good accuracy. But now you may want to, you may have to design a lot of models, train them individually. That's pretty costly. And let's see how do we solve that. So let's first review what happened before. As we talk about previous neural architecture search, it used to be very expensive. Things we gotta train a model, get the accuracy. If it is not good, train again, get the accuracy. It's 48,000 GP hours just on sidebar, not to mention image now. Um, single GPU, that's five years. Google has lots of uh, GPUs, so that's not an issue, but that's definitely an issue for us. So previous work has to utilize all kinds of proxy tasks, like train on sidebar and then generalize, try to generalize on image net using a small architecture space, like very few depth, and repeat the block, assume it works well for different depths. Or just do a couple of epochs of training, say it converted a 90 epochs, and just train a couple of epochs to test drive the accuracy. What is the problem here? Yeah, the model might not convert in accuracy because it is possible that gradient for the loss confidence above the accuracy might have been much better if we allowed it to train. Right, exactly. 
since the model may converge uh, super fast in the beginning, but later is not, have not doesn't have any potential. Or a model may not truly very fast in the beginning, but later it begins to, the loss begins to drop very fast. So that's a problem for few epochs of training compared with training to convergence. And also using flops and parameter count as a feedback for latency. But uh, as we have seen numerous times, flops and parameter count doesn't always reflect the latency and the efficiency. So here um, we propose a technique called proxylase the proxylase mass. So rather than relying on this proxy task, small uh, data set as a proxy, uh, small architecture search as a proxy, small fewer number of epochs as a proxy, or flow of a parameter as a proxy. Now we want to mm -hmm. truly train it on image net, unlock all the layers, directly search them, and also use the latency rather than the flops as the feedback. How do we achieve that? We first build a over-parameterized network and can contain many different choices, much wider, much deeper. You may not want to use it in the end, but now we give you this opportunity to choose between uh, different kinds of layer, like three by three call, five by five, identity, coding, whatever you have. We have everything in the design space. So it's an over-parameterized network with all the candidate paths. This is one path, another path, all the different paths. And we want to simplify NAS to, get, to have a single training process compared with you train the model, evaluate the accuracy, train the model again, evaluate the accuracy, train another model, many training iterations. But now we want to simplify it to be a single training process of this over-parameterized network. And such network has two kinds of parameters. One is the weight parameters. That's just the weight we talk about. The other is the architectural parameters, which defines the architecture. Like if we are choosing um, this branch, this path, the prob this is the probability of choosing a certain um, weight parameter. Okay, so that is the architectural parameter. So actually, we can quantify the architecture by the probability of choosing different paths. And this is the binarized version of the architectural parameter. Only one of them should be one. So we can iteratively update the weight parameters and also the architectural parameters iteratively. Question here. Yeah. So are you saying that we would have weights for every prospective architecture? We have weight for each building block, each path, and you can repeat this layer many times, or you can have you can have this architecture for different layers. This is just one of them. The, the architecture parameter determine the architecture of that layer. Or the, the architecture parameter is the probability, like among these four choices, what is the probability of you should choose this block? Okay, so in this way, one iteration, we update the weight parameters. Well, which one do we update? That is sampled according to the architectural uh, parameter, which is a probability of choosing this path. Like this path has the highest probability, or this one has lower, then it's still possible we sample this path, just the probability is lower. And then in the next iteration, we update the architecture parameters to update um, the alpha beta probability. And finally, um, in the inference time, we can sample uh, the largest probability, okay? And then prune those redundant paths based on those architecture parameters. And we final finalize the architecture to allow only one path of the activation to be active in memory. Otherwise, you have to keep all the different choices in the memory. Right? Previously, one layer had have one uh, convolution, but now you have four convolutions that will explode the memory. And therefore, we can remain 
we can keep the memory footprint uh, from ON to just O1. So in this way, rather than relying on a proxy task and then transfer to the target task in target hardware, we can directly learn the architecture of the target task in target hardware. For example, not on, relying on proxy task on Cypher, but directly use a target task image net. Not relying on sm small architecture search space, but directly open up a larger architecture search space. Uh, rather than using few blocks of training as a proxy, but enable full training. Rather than relying on the flops as a proxy, we, we can profile the latency. So this is one example uh, we have. Uh, the weakness about the max doesn't translate directly to the latency. For example, here, comparing this point and the point right here, uh, this point has lower, num fewer number of max right, compared with this blue dot. Uh, this is the NASNet, um, this is the mobile net. Although NASNet has fewer number of uh, max, you still remember Mac, that's multiply and accumulation. Although NASNet has fewer number of uh, max, it actually has much longer latency from um, 140 something uh, milliseconds to 180 milliseconds, right? So this conventional uh, NAS method have sim similar max compared with human design, but actually higher latency. Another phenomenon here is that when we are uh, scaling the hidden dimension versus the number of layers, this is the same starting point. When we are expanding the, um, the width of the neural network, and measure the latency on the GPU, it actually doesn't, doesn't quite increase because the GPU has such large parallelism, such that even if you are increasing the workload, increasing the channel, it doesn't quite increase the latency. But if you increase the depth dimension, the latency is going to increase um, very uh, proportionally. So which is showing the flops versus the latency. It's not linear. Like these two points, they have very similar flops, but drastically different latency. So latency and flops. Flops is not good representation for the latency. This is another example. Although GPU, the latency is not quite influenced by the hidden dimension. The increase in the hidden dimension doesn't quite change the latency. But Raspberry Pi is very sensitive. Mm -hmm. Has very limited parallelism. We increase the flops a little bit by increasing the hidden dimension size. The latency drastically immediately increase. So the latency feedback becomes super crucial. We have to, we have talked about the uh, accuracy measurement, the accuracy feedback. What about the latency feedback? One naive approach. Certainly, we can measure the latency directly. What is the drawback here? To directly measure the latency and feed it back to the neural architecture search loop. Very slow, right? It can be very slow. It's manual, it's very slow. And also, it can be, I think, get heated, get hot. And it can slow down the inference. One approach is certainly we can build a latency model to predict the latency by first collecting a latency data set. The feature, uh, the input is the architecture representation. The output is the latency. Given the architecture, predict the latency. So there are several approaches. We can first um, to the layer-wise latency providing. Like a neural network consists of many different layers and there are a finite number of choices in different layer. You can probably choose between three and five as kernel size. And for the width, you can choose from 64 to 1K, step size of 64. You can choose a resolution, etc. 
So each, each layer, there are very, there is finite choice. We can pre-allocate, we can pre-compute, pre-measure the latency of each choice and build a lookup table. And what is we are assuming here? We are assuming for different layer, the latency is basically the sum of different layer. Like latency of 10, neural, 10 layer neural network is the latency of layer one plus the latency of layer two plus the latency of layer three, they're addable. And that's indeed the case. However, not all the case, that's not the true for all the case. There are different scheduling we can do, including the patch based inference approach, which we worked on in New Rips 2020-2021. Uh, we are directly inferencing partially for several layers all together. So it may not be edible, which is a KDI here. A more general approach is that we can build a latency data set. Okay, so um, the architecture, operator one, latency, operator two, latency, et cetera. Uh, so when we are building a oh, sorry, this is still about the lookup table. So the lookup table is basically operation one, latency, operation two, Latency, we collect a lot a very long list of operation versus latency, operation of latency. But this is still finite. You have a few choices of the kernel size, a few choices of the input channel, a few choices of, of the output channel, and a few choices of, of resolution. Multiply them together and just do measure, measurement once. So this is showing actually using the latency lookup table. We can get a pretty accurate uh, predicted uh, the real uh, this is the real measured latency versus the predicted latency very close to y equal to x. And the other approach is basically build a more general predictor. Uh, given the architecture, predict the latency. And the what are the features when you are trying to predict? So you can include the kernel size, the width, the resolution, basically all the hyperparameters. And we use uh, several layers of MLP, fully connected layer, to output a single number, which is a predicted latency. You can certainly uh, make this more complicated, like using the graph neural nets we first talked about in the early part of this lecture to encode, to extract the feature of this neural net and then predict its accuracy. Oh, sorry, its latency. Actually, such a predictor can work quite well. Uh, so this is an HAT, hardware aware transformer. Uh, this is the predicted latency. Uh, this is the real latency and um, for transformer architecture. It's very close to y equal to x. So we can use the predictor to estimate the latency rather than physically deploying this model on the hardware and run it. So in that way, uh, we can find specialized models by incorporating both the latency measurement and also the accuracy um, measurement very quickly. So by combining uh, these together, we can outperform this human design moment and V2 by running 88% uh, faster. And we can specialize, design a specialized model for the CPU, for the GPU, for the mobile. Interestingly, this is a, um, has a diagonal pattern where um, the model is designed for the GPU, works the fastest on the GPU platform. The model design on the CPU works the fastest on the CPU. And the model specialized for the mobile works the fastest on the mobile device, which makes sense. And let's see how does the search model differ across different platforms. So this is the history of finding an efficient model using proxy this NAS for the mobile phone versus finding um, a specialized model for the CPU versus the GPU. What do you observe here? 
especially for this few model. It's consistently shallower than these models, right? And also it's wider, aggressively towards this seven by seven convolution, which is in red compared with three by three in blue. Since the GPU has a larger parallelism, I prefer to do more in one single layer compared with doing more layers, okay? which makes sense for the parallelism. All right, so far we talked about this kind of specialization for individual hardware platforms. But in the real world, when you design a neural network, you want to deploy it on different scenarios, on the edge, on the cloud, on Apple mobile phone, and also on Android phones. So how do we save the search costs for diverse hardware platforms? Let's take a break and we have a discussion for multiple hardware platforms. Assume we just have one uh, device, like a brand new, um, brand new iPhone. If you are doing the conventional search methods, uh, we want to search a couple of episodes. And each episode, we want to um, train a model for several iterations to the forward and backward and get accuracy. If it is a good model, then we break. Otherwise, we continue uh, the search process, train another model. Okay, and finally, um, after the training, we find a good model, then we are going to fine tune it a little bit to get a final accuracy. But we are going to repeat this process many times. This is the design cost. I mean, certainly, if you're an app developer, you want to do a startup, you want to have something on Apple, Apple App Store, you certainly want to uh, support not only 2023, but also some older phones. Okay, and try to be inclusive for users who not only have uh, not only for users who have uh, newer phones, but also users who have outdated phones to be inclusive. So immediately you have you have to uh, increase the search costs by finding good models for diverse devices, and that will just explode if you have uh, many different devices from cloud AI to mobile AI to tiny AI. And also another problem is that existing models are very heavily optimized for the GPUs, but doesn't well fit other platforms. There are also other hardware platforms like TPUs, and DSPs, different kinds of accelerators. And how do we improve our productivity so that we can enable a turnkey solution, push the button solution for people to easily find the best fit neural network architecture across diverse hardware platforms. So here is a propo proposed approach. Compared with the other uh, conventional approach, every time we have to train a network, I uh, get the accuracy and latency, okay, train for a day. If the accuracy and ac uh, latency matches, satisfying, then we keep it. Otherwise, we have to do sample again. We repeat this many, many times. Each time it require a long time to train. A natural thinking is that can we amortize this training time? We can just train only once. Okay? But after this one time training, we can get different subnetworks, many, many different subnetworks. We can have a bigger subnet, smaller subnet, a mid subnetwork. We just select our target architecture from this one small approach. We just sample a smaller subset of the weights and make it into a new neural network. And we have to prevent different kinds of smaller neural networks from interfering with each other so they can independently operate. And we select a subnetwork, get the accuracy and latency. If it's satisfying, then we are good. If it is not satisfying, we sample another um, subnetwork and measure the latency and, and accuracy. The second time, we don't have to train it, but we directly use the weight from this one small network. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you pay one time overhead to the, all the work in the beginning to train this one small network. And in the future time, we just need to sample a subnetwork. 
So the key idea is to train once and get money to reduce the design cost. So that we can um, get a larger sub network for newer uh, hardware platforms, like the Agent One, a smaller sub network for weaker, for older, um, less powerful uh, platform like Qualcomm 855. Essentially, a random search uh, or post training. Post training, yes. And when you say sample, is that uniformly or is it weighted by something like uniformly that? random sense? Random sample. We are going to try that in the hover. And of course, you don't have to do random sample. You can certainly do that as a sanity check. Make sure after a few times of random sample, your results are getting better to do a first order sanity check. And after that, will actually implement the evolutionary algorithm to improve the sample efficiency. You are going to implement crossover, the mutation, um, with a smarter way to select a good cell network. An amazing part is that you share the same one small network, so you don't have to train it. That's why you can complete that in the Google Colab. So we have carefully designed the homework so that you can finish within the budget of Google Colab. We tried really hard for lab one, two, three, but for lab four, that is impossible without having to pay Google $10 per month. We did try our best, but please, you want to compete um, lab, uh, lab four for compressing large language model. We have to use the advanced version, the paid version, $10 version uh, for lab four, but up to lab three, um, this method is just so efficient, you can just complete it with a free version. Or we can use a larger network for larger memory, like 12 kilobyte, two memory, uh, two my, uh, two, 12 kilobyte of SRAM, two megabyte of flash, versus a smaller one, you can use 256 kilobyte of SRAM, and uh, one, my, one megabyte of flash. Newer phones, older phones, full battery case, battery saving mode in the morning and night, right? So make sure you develop an app, you can fit different scenarios. We need to talk about training with some of the without like retraining the accuracy goes down. Like do we expect the accuracy to be for all these sub networks or yeah these sub networks you wanna retrain it after the search it to get the best accuracy. That's why we have uh, the follow here for post search training iterations to fine tune the model to fully get the best accuracy. It was on MIT News uh, three years ago. So design new efficient models rather than compressing existing models, just train once, get many, reduce the search cost. Actually, we can have 10 to the 19th sub-networks trained at the same time. You can get many different child networks for free. But the key idea is the child network share the weights, so they don't have to be trained individually with the one small network. They can train jointly and amortize the training cost. So how do we make it possible to train such a one small network? For example, um, a larger model may have seven by seven kernel, middle one, five by five, smaller one, five, three by three. How do they efficiently share the weight? We can have a three by three model uh, inside this seven by seven, and three by, sorry, five by five inside seven by seven, and three by three inside this five by five. Um, and just pass through a MLP that project is 25 to this 25 weights, which is a very smart way. Or similarly for the number of layers, we can progressively shrink the number of layers while we are between training. We can pull first train with full depth and then shrink the depth. Now we can select either uh, these four layers or these three layers. We can randomly sample different choices and training time. And finally, we can continue to shrink either uh, four layers or three layers or only two layers. So this is progressively shrinking the number of layers. 
we can also progressively shrink the number of channels. Like this is the full width. And also we can sort um, the channel importance based on the L2, L1 or L2 norm, similar to channel pruning. And then we can either um, just use three channels or use four channels. The next iteration can you use either three channels or three channels or five, four channels. So we are progressively reducing the kernel size, progressively reducing the later number and also the channel number. Can you please explain how the reducing the layers work? So we just pass through the in O3, we just take the output from that little green layer and ignore layers. You ignore these two layers. And you can a different truly iteration. You can sample different paths randomly. Like here you have one third of the probability of this goes to only two layers. One third of the probability of this goes to I O2 or one third of the O1. So the dimensions are all met or all the same? Their dimensions, the dimensions are certainly the same. And this it's, is within the same resolution, the same stage. So the dimension O1, O2, O3 are the same. Just difference is only it has a few different number of layers. So it, it's still not quite the same with actually training that subnetwork, right? It, At the training time, you are not training a fixed network. Like here, we're showing the animation. Different iterations. We are training different part of the network. That's the key difference. And actually, recently, uh, if you see the rumor about GPT-4, one of the key techniques they use is the mixture of experts, which is uh, sharing some similar taste as this way. It's sparsely activated. Not everything is activated, but sparsely activated both during the training time and also during the test time. So it's not quite an ensemble model, but it is it fair to think of it sort of as like an ensemble across time rather than yeah, yeah. people in every position? Yes, that's, a, that's the right, right analogy. Ensemble, different networks together. So this is put it in another way to visualize it. I made a very uh, good looking slide to show you Elastic resolution, starting with bigger resolution to smaller resolution, and then from full kernel size to partial kernel size, seven by seven to three by three, progressively shrink it, and the depth progressively shrink it from four to two, and also progressive shrinking for the width from four to two. Okay, um, this we call it elastic resolution, elastic kernel size because we can choose either a larger one or a smaller one is elastic. So let's see, how does it perform? This is the roof line analysis. So the X axis of the roof line analysis is the operations per byte. Like fetch one byte of data, how many operations, how many multiplication add we can perform on top of that byte, that is operations per byte which is also called arithmetic intensity. Um, how intense are we going to do a lot of operation on top of one byte, or just do a little bit of operation on, on top of one byte? Okay. Larger is better or smaller is better? Remember, um, data movement is expensive. Computation is cheap. You, find, you fetch one byte of data, you want to do as much operation as possible on top of it to amortize this data fetch overhead. Right? So we want to ideally want a uh, larger ops per byte from the application's perspective. And the one axis is the measured G ops per second, how many uh, gig operations you can do in each second. Initially, uh, this is linear growing. Um, and finally, it's going to peak. It's going to peak, get picked at the peak uh, operations per second of your uh, hardware. For example, if it is uh, 20 tire ops per second, um, it has the peak performance of the processor, then this is the, um, the roof line. And before that, when you are increasing um, the operations per byte, you are bounded by the memory bandwidth. You have a fixed amount of memory bandwidth, the compute is not saturated, 
So as you bring up the operations per byte, you fetch the same amount of bytes. Now you can do more operations per second. Right? So here we are memory bounded. Here we are compute bounded. And the higher the better, the higher the utilization. So when you say multiple operations per byte, that would manifest here as sampling many sub networks for the same set of data rooms for the same batch. Oh, this is much lower level, right? So for a given neural network, you fetch some weight, fetch some activation, you do some compute on top of it. Ah, so, I see. Yeah, that's much lower uh, level of definition. And we can see uh, this is Amazon's net, mobile net v2, roughly here. Uh, but the search, the one small network, the sub network specialized for this FPGA actually have higher arithmetic intensity and also the higher measured geops per second. Although we didn't explicitly teach it, but you need to find, you need to search a model that has higher arithmetic intensity. Uh, it automatically find that by feeding it with the latency feedback. So which is very interesting as an end-to-end -end learning uh, process. So here is the uh, the U3 uh, PGA, uh, GOPS per second, comparing uh, MobileNet and NASNet versus OFA with respect to the GOPS per second. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, you want to deploy some neural nets on it, highly recommend to use one small network to find a specialized model for that. Because MobileNet V2 and Alpine that neither of them are specialized for this particular uh, PGA device. Not only on one device, but also uh, OIP works quite well on diverse hardware platforms, different phones, Samsung phone, Google phone, LG phone, uh, GPU, CPU, and also FPGAs, like on the GPU. Um, this was still using 1080 type because this product was like four years ago. Um, same 72, 72.6, uh, top one, uh, this is top, uh, top one accuracy. I was a little surprised because these days we are talking about 85 help on accuracy. Only after four years, things have so much improvement has been made. With the same 72% help on accuracy, the latency gets reduced from 28 milliseconds to only about 10, 12 milliseconds. Pretty amazing speed up. What's next? We search the good neural network architecture. Can we co design? the accelerator architecture for full stack design. As the Moore's law is slowing down, um, we are no longer having a free lunch provided by the nanotechnology, right? So there's plenty of room at the top by co-designing the algorithm with the hardware architecture. So here, uh, we'll work on this neural accelerator architecture search in APS. To search both the neural architecture and also the accelerator architecture, accelerator architecture. Hardware side, the software side, continue is low. Okay. So this neural architecture, so accelerator architecture, visualization. And what are the design space? What is the key dimensions in design space? We can break, the, break it down into three levels of hierarchy. From the hardware part to the software part with compiler in the middle. On the hardware part, we have the buffer size, local buffer size, global buffer size, the number of PEs, and also compute or resize, the connectivity. The compiler side, we have the loop order, the loop timing size, how do we tell the loop, what is the data flow. On the neural network side, we have the number of layers, number of channels, kernel size, whether we have bypass, what is the quantization precision, and we want to jointly search in one optimization loop, right? To open up a much larger design space in parallel with only doing a neural architecture search. But now we're also working on the accelerator architecture search. The design space can be roughly categorized into two, part, two types. One is sizing related, the other is the connectivity related. related. Sizing related is very easy to search because there are numerical values. You just search a number and just assign the number to it. But uh, what about this connectivity 
parameters, they are non-numerical. For example, um, we have the loop tidy strategy. Um, we have the loop order, okay? one, two, three, or three, two, one. We, we have to uh, take care of the hardware parallelism to, to choose which loop, which for loop do we serialize in time versus parallelize in space. A parallelize in space means you have multiple PEs, means you have the parallel for doing them concurrently. Serialize in time means that you have the for loop right, in the time dimension. Okay, So there is temporal mapping, there is also uh, the spatial mapping. And those non-numerical um, architectural parameters is the key we want to solve here because you cannot just make it into a classification or regression problem because this is choosing one, uh, one or two dimensions, several dimensions among different choices. This is ordering several dimensions. It's not a classic classification problem nor um, regression problem. How do we deal with that? Uh, we use index, one approach, certainly we can use index-based encoding. Like this is one possible loop order we assign it with the value index. Another possible order we assign with a possible loop index. But the problem is that the index value, zero or one, one is larger than zero, two is larger than one, but we not necessarily convey any physical information. Like why this is larger than this, that doesn't quite make sense. This is just a symbol rather than a number, not the integer, not the real number. So the in in increment or decrement of index doesn't convey physical information. So rather than that, we use this importance-based encoding. Okay? Since the importance can be represented by numerical number, say so here uh, we have uh, six choices of the dimension we can parallelize in space, which dimension do we choose? We can learn the importance, relative importance of these different dimensions and just rank it and then sort it by picking the top K of them. Say we have, uh, we can afford to parallelize uh, two dimensions in space. We just find the most important two. Okay? We can assign the importance, uh, which dimension we are going to parallelize and then we are, we are going to learn it, update it, and finally when it converge, we sort it and pick the top top K dimensions that, that we can parallelize in space. Similarly, for the loop order, we learn the importance of each loop. Since for these important loops, we want to uh, put them in the outermost, since it has, uh, it's going to have the least amount of iterations versus those less important loops, we want to put it in the inner loop, which is going to be super hot, looped every time, assuming that's cheaper and not important. Okay. So in this way, we can actually turn those non-numerical hyperparameters into numerical hyperparameters so that we can learn as soon as we become like integers or real world num real numbers, we can um, we can learn them. So together with those uh, numerical parameters like the sizes um, and the piling sizes, which is easily represented, uh, and also the number of dimension, etc., they are all numerical value. So this is the purple part about the uh, blocking, uh, the size of the block, and also these non-numerical values. Which ones do we parallelize in space? So these are parallel fours from C and K, from C and K. Uh, and here is the order that we put from the outermost to the uh, innermost. So we can uh, do this joint search for this neural, neural network um, design space. Uh, this is the population for the mapping for the compiler, and also in the inner loop, that is the Accelerator. Okay. And how does it compare with architectural sizing only? Sizing means we only search 
those new numerical values, like the cash size. Actually, a big improvement when we have the luxury to search not only the numerical architectural uh, sizing only versus searching the connectivity parameters as well. And this is comparison uh, with the starting point, which is a baseline uh, human design, which is basically ResNet 50. Uh, this is a normalized energy delay product. So by applying this hardware architecture search only without changing the neural network architecture, about 4.4x energy delay product reduction. And by searching the neural network architecture code uh, together using the wise for all mass, since every time you're proposing a new neural net uh, hardware architecture, you have to search a new neural network with diverse hardware platforms. Now, once for all network came into play, and 2.7% accuracy improvement. And to actually search NAS design data flow design, uh, design is to paralyze uh, the output height, the output channel dimension. And this is the buffer size in tools, 496 byte, which is quite different from human design. So that's all for the neural architecture and hardware aware neural architecture search. Now we're going to switch gear to talk about some applications. How do we accelerate real world applications with NAS in particular with the once for all approach? First, transformers. So far, we talk a lot about CN models, what about transformers? So this work is expanding uh, the once for all network. To transformers. So we first train this one small transformer and then de uh, derive different sub transformers by weight sharing. We can use a smaller transformer for IoT device, a larger transformer, wider transformer for GPU, a uh, deeper and shallower uh, and narrower transformer for the CPU. And compared with e the evolved transformer, the HAT hardware aware transformer, you get much better latency and model size while preserving the accuracy. You can run on Raspberry Pi, and also GPU have a specialized model for different hardware platforms. And also we can apply this once wall approach for point cloud. You know, point cloud is pretty sparse. Um, it captures the uh, spatial information in the 3D world, so previously we have talked about 2D vision, but this is 3D vision, very crucial for ADAS, autonomous driving applications. We certainly want to run it at fast frame rates. This is latency critical, safety critical, to understand the surroundings at higher frame rates. So here uh, for the um, point cloud, we, we made this SPV NAS sparse point uh, voxel neural architecture search. So here uh, we train this super network with uh, different stages we can choose from um, three uh, full depth, uh, partial depth, or even smaller amount of depth from three, two, three, and one, two, three. Okay, so progressively shrinking the depth. And also uh, we can progressively shrink the width. So this channel input. Uh, channel, uh, channel output, we can support these two dimensions. So you support elastic uh, channel number and also elastic depth. So we get a super network, sample a sub network, we test the latency and accuracy. If it doesn't meet our target, we have to propose another candidate network and repeat this process. And the super network remains unchanged, you pay the overhead only once. And we searched using the evolutionary strategy, which we are going to implement in our homework for lab three. Uh, we do the mutation. This way, we change the number of channels. Um, and also, we do the crossover, get a, a gene from both parents, part from parent one and part from parent two. Okay, we are going to implement that in our homework. And finally, select the best fit and continue to get the next generation. And this is a demo. Uh, in terms of the top that we have four, different four frames per second versus SPD mass, 
9.1 frames per second very much faster. And this is once more for, uh, for gas, dynamic models. Dynamic models used to be pretty compute intensive. And like we can make her look younger, but it takes about three seconds. It's pretty slow. It's computationally heavy, but we want to make it possible to run interactive, interactive photo editing locally on our edge devices, like on our iPad. Right. So how do we make it fast? Um, so the difference here is that the dynamic model not only have just one model, but it has a, a distributor and also a generator. Right. So we train it once, we train generator only once, we make the generator to be once for all. And then we can select a small sub-network, a low cost, a very fast prototyping. We can just show it, immediately see what is the effect. Okay, we change the hair color. Now uh, immediately see um, the response. And click the finalize button. And what we are doing here is actually it's running this uh, largest um, full model, okay, which gives you the best quality result with slightly longer time, which is affordable because you do it only once. And here is another example. Usually getting older is associated with building eyeglasses. So that makes sense. So we can bring this far to the left to remove the eyeglasses. After everything is done, finalize, which is running this full network, slower, higher quality. Here we have the one last example. It's immediate. Everything is open source. Feel free to check out any cloud scan and can run it actually locally on a laptop, MacBook. This was in 2021. I believe the MacBook is much stronger these days than two years ago. So all of the different models are trained offline once and then they're downloaded with some update to the iPad or whatever. Right? Exactly. So this is all inference. This is all inference. Exactly. Yes. All your first time. And another good point compared with larger models, smaller model, you may have to download many different versions of model. Big model, small model, many models. But now you can just download one model. And then at runtime time decide whether I need to run a smaller one or a larger one or seamlessly treat, get a trade-off. Yep. Should the whole model um, load into memory when you do inference, or just the sub-network? Just the sub-network. Just the sub-network. And actually, in this use case of the thinking about the actual use case, the main value is actually the fact that it's more of a storage play, right? Because the, the actual training of the model happens very rarely, so the savings there are maybe less important than this example, and it's more the fact that you only store one model on your account without the device. Correct. The training time is actually longer than just training one model. The training time is about two to three times the original training time. So the training time is actually longer. The whole purpose is to make the runtime, the inference time, more efficient. Another insight is that this model obtained from this once for network actually all perform the same architecture trained from scratch. That's a very interesting phenomenon. This small model is even better than the model itself trained from scratch. We suspect that is due to the regularization where the same set of weight not only have to work with itself, but also have to work when it acts as a sub-network as another network. And the weight sharing are learning together, making it more general, generalizable. Lots of things remains to be analyzed. Very interesting phenomenon. So, and we also suspect this kind of over-parameterization can sometimes help with uh, the training of smaller network. So which subnet is fine-tuned, correct? And then, uh, how does it affect the, like, 
the accuracy of the, the largest model. Uh, so if you are determined just use of one particular sub network, you have to fine tune that, fine tune that. But in this case, um, we want to run both the larger model and different sub networks. But in this case, we didn't fine tune them. We didn't fine tune them. We just directly use the sample sub network to run in first. Still works super well. That is showing the effect. Well, only when you are pretty sure you are going to build ASIC, you want to just run this model, then you can fine tune it irrespective of other components. And finally, for host estimation, again, we train this one small model, then get the sub networks uh, with a single path. We actually find just one single single path works quite well. It's like the latency, accuracy, uh, and IP trade off, actually about 5x latency reduction so, so that you can uh, build such real time uh, post estimation, multi person post estimation for. Um, Activity recognition and other um, um, estimations. So actually, last semester, um, one of the students used this demo. Um, she's on the rowing team and use a uh, build a trainer app using um, this tool, which is quite interesting to distinguish uh, the different positions when she's uh, doing the rowing of the training. This could be one of the uh, final projects. We have a couple of such Android phones in our lab. So if you decided uh, to build a final project on a mobile on Android device, we can borrow you a phone. Uh, here are more examples uh, for lightweight detection, uh, case estimation, and segmentation. Another interesting part is once for next one, also get applied to quantum AI, which we're going to cover a little bit in the later part of this lecture. So not necessarily, if you have more number of qubits, that's not necessarily a good thing because it gives you a larger capacity, but also a lot of noise. So here we're showing um, this is the ideal case versus the measured case. Uh, the noise-free simulation versus the measured result on the IBM, um, Yorktown, Quantum machine, the um, at least four, only four classes, at least four accuracy actually use a big gap between the simulated accuracy versus the measured accuracy. And actually, um, the gap is due to the, um, the, the noise. Okay? So the topology of a quantum circuit matters. Not necessarily we put more qubit, we get good accuracy. Um, so here we can train a uh, parameterized super circuit. Okay. Uh, we can have different choices, but we put everything in our design space and train uh, the super circuit. And each time we sample a sub circuit, uh, each right rectangle here is a gate. It can be either there or, or not there. So we can sample different sub circuits and finally search uh, the best one. And here is comparing with the baseline, and this is our measured result, which is accuracy on at least four, classifying four digits. Uh, this is measured on real quantum computer, real QC, getting a much better accuracy from 40 something percent to 80 something percent. I call me that quantum noise is the bottleneck of quantum neural nets, a big degradation about accuracy, and quantum mass, quantum noise aware search for robust circuit, basically train super circuit, and then search a sub circuit that is robust to the noise and prune away those small magnitude quantum gates. So pruning also applies over there. Uh, if a gate is, is not necessary, it may uh, incurs noise, so it may, it may supply as well just to prune it away. And we build this Torch Quantum Library, uh, which is open, offered also open source. All right, so that's all for today's lecture. We covered how do we aware NAS, how do we efficiently search efficient neural, neural network architectures, or the zero shot heuristics, how do you hard to search architecture to co search, and several applications. In the next lecture, we are going to talk about a new chapter, which is knowledge distillation. <laughs>